Briefly before we get started, uh, congratulations, uh, Mr. Romola, to have uh, on the opening ceremony in the second day such a, a full audience here to hear from such a distinguished panel. Uh, yesterday, in the opening ceremony with His uh, Excellency President El Sisi, I talked about this resilience in the industry uh, in the last 12 months. We know there's been a huge test, as Commissioner Simpson said in her opening remarks, uh, because of Russia Ukraine. Uh, and I think in the thematics of our panel discussion today, uh, we should talk about signals. What are the signals that the ministries are sending with the commissioner from the European Union and the commissioner from the African Union are sending to the CEOs of this room today and the operators uh, for tomorrow, right? Like the show itself, now evolving to the energy forum, we have to look at the entire supply chain going forward and what signals we're sending for natural gas in terms of not just a transition fuel or a fuel for the next 20 to 30 years, the development of hydrogen and the investment we see going in there today, uh, and then and uptaking renewables as fast as possible. Uh, can we give a nice round of applause to the panelists and I'll jump right into the debate today. Thanks very much. Uh, Mr. Amola, a key question here is what we've learned in the last year and, and the signals you want to send today about getting that energy mix correct because we were caught flat-footed, if you will. I often talk about global mapping. Uh, are we too dependent on one particular supplier? And for the European Union's case, it, it was Russia. So when it comes to the Eastern Med, what is the role of the Eastern Med fall into that trap of over-dependency on any one region of the world? What do you think? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, John, for the question. And actually, I think that, uh, as you said, uh, since last year, what, uh, um, what we learned is that um, we needed to be ready. And uh, I have to say that uh, I think uh, the vision come back to a few years, in 2017, and the initiative of having this East Mediterranean Gas Forum was then uh, accepted in 2018 few years ahead of the Russian-Ukrainian war. So we were preparing ourselves for collaboration and uh, collaboration among the East Mediterranean countries, thinking of countries that have resources but do not have facilities for exports, countries of transition, and countries uh, that are consuming energy. So with this collaboration, we had already reached out to the EU back in 2018, and we started in parallel the inception and the creation of the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum that included uh, seven members, and most importantly was Israel and Egypt as producing uh, countries. However, the assets of our LNG facilities with the pipelines with Egypt were giving this advantage of quickly uh, liquefying this gas and exporting it. So wanting to prove that we are a reliable uh, source of supply to the EU uh, by demonstrating and proving the concept. And I think that we have been able to prove the concept uh, because uh, once uh, this uh, war uh, started and the crisis and the shortage of gas uh, started to increase in Europe, I think we have been uh, quickly able to prove and to demonstrate that we are a ready-made solution and we are ready to prepare and to give hand to Europe and, and this was translated by having this uh, important MOU signed between the three parties, uh, uh, Egypt, Israel and the EU, witnessed by President von der Leyen. So I think since then, uh, the level of confidence and trust uh, was built and uh, we are talking together now for further enhancement and collaboration. But to close, I just wanted to say what were the lessons learned, and as you say, so when I said we have proven the concept, so countries around, around us, and we have seen possibility in Lebanon, we have seen Cyprus, we have seen uh, uh, Gaza Marine, we are seeing potential of gas uh, discoveries and discovered already that needs to be uh, quickly, uh, I would say, developed. And we are telling them, here is the rule. 
and here is how you can uh, have your uh, gas monetized through our facility because we have demonstrated and we have proven that there is a market and that there are facilities and collaboration uh, that is waiting for you. So I think this is a very good, um, I would say, role model uh, that was proven in the East Mediterranean that could be replicated uh, on a bigger uh, scale in the Mediterranean basis. Well, very interesting. I, I want to widen the conversation now because there's the potential for Africa, and I'm going to bring that up with the commissioner from the African Union. These are super directional microphones, so you actually have to bend it a little bit more, but I'm going to start with uh, Kadri Simpson, if I may, here. I find it quite extraordinary that we were lulled into uh, dependency on one major supplier being Russia. And as a human species, should we be able to map resources in a much better way? And it applies to food security, it uh, you know, strategic minerals with China's concentration of 85% of refining capacity for strategic minerals, which go into the energy transition for wind turbines and, and uh, solar PV as well. Did we learn this shock today where, as a commissioner, as the European Union and whole, your collaboration with the AU, with players like Egypt and Israel, that we have to be much more persuasive in spreading our risk? How would you, how would you categorize that in the lessons for the last 12 months, uh, Commissioner Simpson? Yes, so indeed. Should I elaborate? Yes. <laughs> Um, it, I mean, it was the, the test of all times, was it not, as a commissioner? It was part of our legacy that uh, until 2021, 40% of natural gas uh, that Europeans consumed came from Russia. These were pipelines built decades ago, um, transporting uh, natural gas through Ukraine or via Turkey. And then, of course, the new pipeline, uh, subsea pipeline called Nord Stream. And as a result, uh, Russia had this um, dominant position in our gas market, but we invested a lot uh, for alternative uh, supply routes. So without thinking about that already a decade ago, we would have not been able to launch last year pipeline that connects um, European markets with um, Norwegian gas fields. We do have now pipeline connection uh, that connects us uh, with Azerbaijan, and we do have impressive LNG terminal network in place that allowed us to, uh, to receive 134 billion cubic meters LNG last year. And this um, made the difference. Uh, we were able to replace Russian gas without any disruption in our uh, economy, uh, without any need to ration. Uh, and on top of that, we were able to fill our underground gas storage. So this is almost the end of the heating season in Europe. Uh, temperatures were mild, but we still do have 65 billion cubic meters in our underground sta gas storage. And that is also the reason why we were able to stabilize the prices. But of course, uh, we will prioritize uh, international partnerships um, like we do have with Egypt. Uh, trusted partners who uh, respect uh, their contracts and we want to see that uh, these partnerships uh, go beyond uh, the fossil fuel uh, sector. So um, just uh, this week uh, Europe announced uh, uh, our uh, standards for renewable hydrogen and this is a step-by-step -step approach that, uh, that by 2049 our gas market will be decarbonized, so a couple of decades to go, but, uh, but we know that there are sec sectors uh, in transport, in industry, that will need uh, molecules, and um, this uh, means that, uh, that uh, with the help of uh, international partners too, we will cover part of this uh, demand, this imported, uh, imported fuels right now, this natural gas in the future is uh, decided. Okay, very good. I'm going to allow a little bit more time in the first round of the questions, and then I want to have a dialogue between the three of you after we finish uh, calling on Amani Abu Zaid. And it's great to see you again. Can you bring your microphone up and just keep, yeah, if you can just keep it there, it would be better. Yeah, it's falling for you. 
Okay, sorry. I'm sure you can manage. It's not your, it's not your fault. Um, I want to have a very frank discussion here, and because this debate came up at the World Economic Forum, uh, and the treatment of natural resources on the African continent, uh, what should be going to export to the European Union and what should stay at home uh, and allow African countries to develop and have cross-border pipelines and energy sharing, particularly when it comes to natural gas. I'm not looking for a fist fight here, but I'm looking to clarify, should we be able to underwrite African production that stays on the continent and doesn't only go to the European Union? I'll start with you, uh, Amani, please. If you can hold up that microphone, it's too low. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, John, and uh, allow me at the outset to uh, thank the Arab Republic of Egypt and particularly, of course, His Excellency Tarek al Mullah for uh, hosting me, even though I'm Egyptian but uh, not living in Egypt currently, to bring me home. Uh, so that's already a very positive thing for me. And, uh, access to energy and for those who have energy, a just transition. Uh, one that is um, measured, one that is, uh, uh, as I said, equitable, and one that takes into account the, realistically uh, the needs and context of each and every country, not mm. just the continent, but each and every country and uh, uh, within our continent. And this African common position was approved at the highest level at the African summit uh, last July 2022. And maybe allow me to thank you, John, but particularly thank His Excellency Tarak Mullah because uh, it was here in Egypt that uh, the, the start of this conversation and the common position in Africa uh, was, I mean, the conversation starts. So it's, we, we, I think we owe you one. This oh, one, right. One. For both for Egypt and it concluded and at COP27, right? Absolutely. Exactly. And we took that to the, to the COP27, and that's what we are advocating in addition to a large programs for to accelerate access in, in the continent. Uh, the second uh, element is energy security or security, I would say, because it's not just about energy, and it did not start with the war. I know that people's focus, uh, or talk about it only because it happened in Europe in 2022, but it started with COVID, with the serious interruption in, you know, in the supply chains, where we have several, I mean, on two thirds of our continent do not produce gas and, uh, or oil. So very much dependent on uh, uh, the outside to get the supply. So the security issue started then. And that is why we are promoting also and accelerating a program that we actually were having uh, jointly with the uh, European Union on a single African electricity market, which is going to be a, a single African energy market, but also a, 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 a local uh, content, a, a transformation uh, in our countries. And I'm happy to say that uh, even in the renewables, a few, a few months ago, we have two major contracts were signed in uh, in, uh, in DRC and in uh, 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 and in Zambia to manufacture uh, 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 the batteries locally. Uh, that was signed with the with the with the US, uh, but also in terms of capabilities and uh, uh, and in terms of projects linking regionally uh, and transcontinentally uh, the continent supply and demand to ensure that the continent is self-sufficient, especially that we are, we have an abundance of uh, energy resources, all kinds uh, of, uh, of energy. Okay, now, I'm just going to need you to conclude. Yes, and uh, going back to the question that you asked, what remains uh, in the country, what, what grows outside? I think this is the call for our countries to decide upon, for each and every country also to balance. I mean, we do have our leaders and our countries have their own vision for uh, the national needs and what can be exported. We have a country like Egypt, which is, you know, we're very proud with the, the work that has been done, whether to export uh, some and then keep, you know, use locally uh, right. renewable energy, whether to export more uh, or to use more in, in uh, clean cooking and so on and so forth. So first, it's the country's decision and the country's context. Two, 
we are working also, we are advocating to our own countries. Uh, we know that our country suffered tremendously under COVID, you know, lack of revenues. And one could be tempted to export everything, right. uh, uh, you know, benefiting from the current high prices. Prices are not going to be high for long. So you don't want to export everything and continue to be a net exporter and then find yourself again a few years from now still with half or more than half of your population not having access to either electricity. Well, it's quite extraordinary what you're saying. Thank you very much. Uh, we only have 13 minutes left, so I'm going to ask for one-minute interventions from everybody from, on these next uh, topics because we want to cover a lot of territory. Uh, does that include now, do the development banks, Commissioner Simpson, uh, can they underwrite hydrocarbon projects on the continent for gas that stays on the continent, or do you just support underwriting of development bank funds for export? Can we just clarify the position because there's a lot of debate around it? Please. For sure, we will prioritize uh, investments uh, that will serve the investors for decades to come. That means renewables. So if you can uh, cover your domestic demand with renewable electricity, that makes sense. Also energy efficiency will be our top priority. So uh, our uh, funds will be dedicated for renewables. Okay. Is that realistic in, in this environment today? Minister Omola and then to uh, Commissioner Abuze. Well, it will be a little bit challenging, so uh, definitely you need uh, to uh, do perhaps, and this is what I can understand and how we can engage uh, the EU and other international uh, uh, multilateral uh, investment uh, and financing institutions, and this through having an integrated energy uh, transition master plan. And I think that this integrated master plan, when it includes, uh, yeah, perhaps some parameters of, I would say, uh, a transitory uh, fossil fuel, but ultimately reaching to renewables, meanwhile using decarbonization for uh, fossil fuel, that will be a comprehensive uh, plan that we could perhaps have, in my opinion, some room with uh, such uh, multilateral uh, international uh, funds and uh, uh, international uh, investment institutions. Uh, other than that, if we will be left alone, that would be a little bit challenging. So definitely we need to have some, uh, to mobilize some funds somehow, but it needs to be uh, of, uh, of uh, with concessionary funds, not uh, traditional investment uh, funds. So this is how we see, especially when we talk about Africa, when we talk about uh, countries uh, or developing countries in general. So uh, therefore, we need to have the formula where we can satisfy both. Uh, and that's possible, you think? Exactly. It's very, it's, no, it's so fascinating, because it's at the heart of the discussion. I was in the session with you at the World Economic Forum, the same question came up. Can we land on a policy, uh, Commissioner Abu Zaid, that's acceptable to the European Union, the international lenders, and the African players who sit on these natural resources or not? I, I ask for one minute, please. Our prime uh, uh, target uh, is our people. That has to be very clear. So our work, our mission, our advocacy, our projects are for Africa and for Africa's needs. That is the priority. Two African institutions, development institutions, one of them is the African Bank, and some are already here. We acknowledge that uh, and gas is very much part even of the transition, not just for access, but it's part of the transition, not only as a transition fuel, but it's the base load for the renewable energy, given you know, the volatility and variability of uh, the various uh, uh, renewable uh, resources. So uh, we have to be realistic. Three, uh, uh, just for everybody's knowledge, we have more than 20 African countries uh, who have, uh, uh, which have 90% of their energy coming from renewable resources. So we are the first, we are leaders in renewable energy, by the way. That's a fantastic point. And yes, and not only that, in a few months' time, 
And despite this extremely challenging situation worldwide, 10 African countries are producing green hydrogen. Four African countries are on their way to produce sustainable aviation fuel. So that is happening in a continent that emits the least in the world. So we are leaders and we know exactly what climate disasters could be and how important renewable energy is, but our partners should also be beside us and company, not only as a I mean, partnership uh, for the good of the people, but because it's highly profitable. And uh, Africa is emerging out of this, now it's called poly crisis, of this poly crisis as the giant in energy. So if you're in energy, this is the place to be. And that's my message to the audience here. Okay, very good. Um, it's interesting, I read a piece in research for the panel, it, it was a Forbes piece from Ariel Cohen, who's a, quite a very solid columnist. He said, will Africa save the European Union uh, when it comes to energy and strategic uh, minerals? Uh, Commissioner Simpson, does it really have the potential that can be unleashed at this stage? Uh, and does it include a pipeline that goes from Nigeria to Niger to Algeria and can export to the European Union? Will that get completed in your view? First of all, uh, I do believe that Africa has vast resources. And um, if you compare the situation from where we are coming from, then yes, there is always uh, a chance that someone will sabotage a pipeline that transfers gas. But no one is uh, able to switch off the sun or wind. So hydrogen and renewable energy, this is very democratic. Everybody has access to these resources. Um, this is uh, why we do really want to support African well, project um, to allow access to electricity also in this regard that this electricity is produced here uh, using renewable resources. Now, um, if we're talking about uh, saving Europe, uh, then uh, indeed our international partners played a key role that Europe survived this winter. But we ourselves also prioritize that we will not create a global situation where there is a deficit of uh, natural gas. So we prioritize savings and European 27 member states, they cut their gas consumption by 20%. Hmm. This is not easy no, uh, to achieve these kind of savings. But we were really, if you are looking at global map, the only global region that cut both gas consumption and electricity consumption. And uh, that makes sense because uh, the cheapest, greenest energy is the one that we don't consume. So also from our side, we are willing to share the knowledge, how to, well, um, how to um, produce fossil fuels in more sustainable way. In this regard, I highly appreciate that Egypt joined the global methane pledge because if you capture this methane, you can sell it. Yes. And, and there is, again, I can, I can confirm there will be markets for natural gas for decades to come in Europe. We just will not um, invest our public funds into fossil fuels anymore because step by step we will, uh, we will uh, decarbonize our markets and, uh, and if there are uh, needs, investment needs in fossil fuel sector, then they are happening against the market demand. No, yeah, it's interesting. There's been no shortage of interest now with uh, BP. Uh, we saw from Apache Corporation, Total, and Mozambique, despite the political problems, there's money at hand that's uh, uh, being put to use. Uh, carrying on what the commissioner said about decarbonization, can you talk about the, it looks like if I came from the outside, you said decarbonization day, you know, what the heck is it? But is it for real, the initiatives here to push for decarbonization as we start to expand natural gas, Minister? Yes, sure, we are really working on, uh, I mean, uh, first we did join the methane pledge, the global methane pledge initiative, and actually uh, we are committed, and therefore we have started already, and uh, we did put the roadmap uh, into, uh, and now we are working into implementation. So this is, in our opinion, a quick win, and uh, this is uh, an easy task, uh, bearing in mind that this uh, capture of methane uh, and methane uh, reduction will be 
savings from one side, which will be additional gas that was lost, we can uh, export since we are talking about exports or using the most degree. Number two, of course, we are uh, part of reducing the emissions and uh, the uh, global warming and uh, uh, therefore, this is from one side. Meanwhile, we have identified several projects that we have uh, started to decarbonize and we have established a consortium of different international uh, and multinational partners that we do have currently that are in the energy sector in order to put uh, in place some uh, pilot projects to prove how we can easily uh, start decarbonizing our operations. Number three, we really, uh, one of the mo most important initiatives that we took uh, together at the EMGF level, that EMGF itself as uh, a forum that includes several countries, uh, took the initiative of decarbonizing the, uh, the natural gas among its member countries. So we are there and uh, I think uh, we have the momentum now and we are gaining more and more uh, supporters and not only that, also uh, several uh, international uh, organizations are uh, supporting us technically and financially with this regard. Very interesting. It's interesting around the EMGF, Eastern Mediterranean Gas Forum, uh, it's a coalition now. You know, it started as an idea here at the Energy Forum has actually grown into something much wider. So I wonder, we only have two and a half minutes left. I'm going to go to the uh, Commissioner for the African Union uh, on this. Can gas serve as a political unifier? Uh, we see that a unifier, I mean, it's very interesting to see the discussions. The U.S. put a lot of political capital on uh, Israel and Lebanon establishing an economic zone. Uh, and could it do the same in Africa uh, to provide as a bridge to political solutions as well? You've seen what's happened uh, in Mozambique, right? Total had, to, had force majeure. But can we see now where energy actually provides a political stability, in your view? One minute, please, and I'm going to finish with Kadri. Uh, I don't think it's just gas. Yes, I think what we should be welcoming and bringing back uh, is uh, uh, regional and continental and intercontinental uh, uh, partnerships. Uh, we do not wish the situation that happened recently to result into the globalized world, to you know uh, uh, this uh, uh, closing new borders and and having this skepticism in working with the others. On the contrary, this situation should force us to work with each other more. Going back to energy, energy is heavy in investments, is heavy in uh, technical expertise. Uh, uh, there are it's a it's a complex. Uh, uh, these are complex projects i.e. they call for important partnerships. So definitely energy in general uh, could be unifiers, and, uh, uh, but then even more importantly, the nexus energy, water, food, because this, this is what we're going through now, are very much unified. So let us just work on that, how to promote again partnerships on a win-win basis not net exporter, net importer, no, on a win-win basis to ensure everyone's well-being, but not the someone who takes it all and then they leave the other without anything, or let us just work on true, positive, constructive partnerships for the good of our people, uh, but also the good of the world. Thank Excellent. You. Final thoughts from uh, Mr. Uh, Simpson, and I'm going to come to Tarek Amola as well for uh, his final comments on this panel. Uh, it's interesting, the Qataris now, uh, the Gulf players, you know, Qatar is obviously one of the largest natural gas players, but it's come into Lebanon uh, to take the stake of, of Russia. ADNOC has developed an international division, is looking at the Eastern Mediterranean Basin as well. Uh, Bubadla Petroleum is already invested in Israel. Is this what um, Commissioner Abu Zaid's suggesting here? We should have major players collaborating in a deeper way so we avoid the shock that we had in the last year, country? I think that the um, global economy will benefit if we don't face uh, major 
volatility in energy markets. We all know that uh, there are some levels of uh, crude oil that could trigger global recession. Now when step-by-step uh, -step LNG market is also a global one, um, we might well, we might extend this, uh, this uh, vulnerability also to the gas markets. And indeed, stability, predictability is beneficial both for producing countries and the ones who are dependent on imports. Um, so um, I think there our partnerships have, have to deliver that, uh, that, um, that we will keep this global growth um, and on top of that, uh, we'll cover our cr ever-growing energy demand with uh, alternatives that will not harm our cl climate ambition. And in this regard, Europe uh, is European Union and our 27 member states. We are the number one global um, uh, climate um, um, support provider to third countries. So we will keep this position. Uh, but I'm also um, celebrating the momentum that on top of our Green Deal investment plan that was our growth uh, uh, strategy. Now United States also has announced their Inflation Reduction Act. And that means that if we together will invest heavily into new technologies, then of course it brings prices down. Yeah, there was, there was criticism of the IRA, uh, the Reduction Act, initially because many thought it was protectionist, but it's actually sparking a boom. And the next wave, as uh, uh, President van der Leyen said at the World Economic Forum, is the next security act. Act, net zero security act for the European Union. Final thoughts, if I would roll back the clock six years to the original Egypt's forum that we had, would you ever think that you have Lebanon, Israel, Cyprus, Greece, Egypt in this collaboration in the Eastern Med? It was really overlooked and its time has come and can it include Turkey to solve the problem in the region, do you think? What do you hope? Well, uh, six, year, uh, six years ago we had the ambition and actually we had a vision and that's why we have created all what you are talking about and, and, and now proudly I'm saying we are in Cairo and I am happy and uh, blessed that we have Commissioner Simpson, we have Commissioner Abu Zaid with us, uh, energy for Europe, energy for Africa, who would thought about it six years ago. So we are here to, to show and to prove that we are really an energy hub together and uh, we did succeed so far but we are still at the beginning. I think that there are many opportunities to come and we have a lot of things to do. And, uh, but having uh, the respectful panelists with me this morning, with all the audience, shows that we are on the right track. Great. We went a few minutes longer, but I think it was important to get the, uh, the final topics into place here. Uh, that was a robust debate, I have to say, and an honest one. It was the most honest discussion I've heard about EU uh, and AU collaboration and then having uh, Egypt as a hub. I have you on two more panels, and I want to talk to you about the LNG hub to come, but uh, time has run out. Can we get a nice, warm thanks to the panelists today for this discussion? Thank you very much.